Welcome everyone. Hi to those who are joining. Um, our webinar is going to be about an hour tonight um, and uh, we have a mini presentation from Dr. Sotti, um, who is from Apricity Fertility Clinic uh, based in London. And um, he is going to be answering questions and giving a presentation about treatment options and what you might want to consider and look for and ask a specialist or clinic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sotti, and I'm saying Dr. Sotti because I didn't find your name quite hard to pronounce. Um, please, could you introduce yourself, Anna Prisity? So it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, everyone does call me Dr. Sotti. My name is Sotirios Saravelos. It's uh, originally a Greek name. Um, so I'm a consultant gynecologist and subspecialist in reproductive medicine. I've worked... Um, in the UK, but also abroad, which has been great because I, I can get a feel of different treatments around the world because fertility is a topic common all over the world, but treatments can vary a little bit. Um, I work with Imperial College, but also Apricity Fertility. And with Apricity Fertility, we've been trying to help people from all over the country in their fertility journey in terms of educating them about um, um, problems with fertility, but also how to access uh, fertility care. Uh, Apricity itself is actually the first virtual fertility clinic in the world, which means that we are able to offer treatments mostly from the comfort of each individual's home and only visiting the clinics um, when necessary for procedures or, well, I was going to say ultrasound scans, but nowadays we're trying to do ultrasound scans at home as well. So. Um, I guess as we go through the webinar, if in the end um, people have any questions or want to get in touch, we can offer them the details as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about how to know which fertility treatment is right for me. So, yeah, so I guess, Eloise, you'll be controlling the toggles and I'll, I'll be chatting through the slides. Looking at the title, how to know what which fertility treatment is, is best for me, um, I was thinking to myself, actually, this encompasses the whole of my job, because that's what we do as fertility specialists. The first question we ask is, do I need fertility treatment in the first place? Because actually, every now and then, um, not every now and then, very frequently, couples will often, and individuals will get stressed about their fertility. And often their first consultation or tests are a reassurance and saying that you don't need treatment as yet. So do I need fertility treatment in the first place? If you move on to the next slide, I have written when one should seek fertility treatment. So these are the things I think about. So what we should be asking is, what am I hoping to achieve? Do I need a baby ASAP? Do I want a baby now, myself or with my partner? Or do I want to preserve my fertility? Am I single? Am I in a same-sex relationship? Am I in a heterosexual relationship? Am I less than 35, 35 to 40, over 40? Have I been trying ever? Have I been trying for a long time? And do I have any other pre-existing medical conditions? Sometimes you go through someone's history and they say, no, 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 no surgery, no medical problems, no smoking, no sur nothing at all. And other times people have actually had a long journey before they try for a baby. Um, and within that journey, question of whether anyone's had previous fertility treatments as well is going to be very relevant. So it's important to, to state that actually infertility is not the only reason to consider treatment. Um, fertility preservation for social reasons can be a reason someone goes down the route of treatment, of fertility treatment. Someone who's not ready to have a baby as yet or um, who hasn't found the right partner, for example. Sometimes we're faced with medical conditions, um, for example, cancer or undergoing treatments related to cancer, like chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which means that we may wish to preserve our fertility before these treatments because they will affect our chances of having a baby in the future. Other individuals and couples, they may be single, um, wanting to be single parents or um, having a, a baby um, when, while they're in a same-sex relationship. And again, they might need um, fertility treatment because of their own circumstances rather than being infertile per se. Something slightly rarer is families who have genetic conditions who are 
worried about passing on their genetic condition to their children. And actually fertility treatments can be used to screen the embryos for these conditions and pick out the embryos that don't carry this disease so that um, the offspring babies won't suffer from that. So with regards to age, age is the number one factor that everyone talks about. And indeed it's probably the primary driver of infertility or the number one cause. Um, because infertility increases with age, we've got the little graph on the right, at about the age of 35, um, the, the, ch the risk of infertility will increase quite rapidly. And therefore, the usual recommendation is that if we are less than 35 years of age, we can often wait for one year. The NHS often says two years even before seeking any help. However, once we're over the age of 35, because there's such a rapid decline in fertility, it's good to be proactive because no one would want to look back and say, if I'd done this a year ago, I may have had a child, whereas now I can't have a baby. So after six months, it's worth looking at someone's fertility if they're trying at the age of over 35. Some other times, there might be medical conditions where you need to seek help even before you try. So from the men's side, if they've had a, an accident or testicular torsion, say even as a child, that they've been told that it may cause problems with fertility, when they're ready to have a baby, they could check their semen analysis sooner rather than later. I've seen young women um, in A&E who have had large ovarian cysts and torsions, again, just like the testes, it's when it rotates around, either an ovary or a testes, and the blood supply can choke the, the actual ovary. Um, and these women, for example, they may have damaged ovaries, or they may even have to have their ovaries or one of the ovaries removed. So in occasions like that, it may be worth touching base with a fertility specialist before you even try. Now, how long does it get to get to get pregnant according to age. So at about the age of 30, um, 30 years of age, women will, well, seven, seven out of 10 women will be able to become pregnant within a year. At the age of 35, about six in 10 women will be able to get pregnant. And at the age of 40, less than half will get pregnant within a year. So that demonstrates the effect that age has. Now, Thinking of lifestyle factors, I have had patients come to me and say, well, my BMI is high, I'm a smoker, I'm struggling to conceive, shall I just have fertility treatment? And what I try to say is actually, it shouldn't really be a substitute for a better lifestyle. We know that being underweight or overweight um, may be associated with um, difficulties in fertility and also uh, in pregnancy complications like miscarriage or preterm labor. So whether you become pregnant naturally or through um, assisted conception, fertility treatments, we should try and optimize BMI. Stress also affects um, chances of success. Well, chances, duration of attempts for natural conception is what the studies have shown. So you will often, it will often take longer to get pregnant um, if you are stressed. And that was presented at one of the annual conferences as the keynote lecture years ago, I think in Munich it was. And it was quite you know, interesting at the time. Of course, it's a vicious circle because if you, if you suffer from infertility, that increases stress. And then you're worried that actually that will have a knock-on effect as well. But if you have stress and high levels of stress, doing treatment won't just overcome that. You know, The stress will affect your treatment potentially. Alcohol, same thing. Smoking, same thing. All of these things should be optimized, whether we're trying naturally or whether we need to go down the route of fertility treatment. And smoking three times more likely to experience delay in getting pregnant. That's quite high, isn't it? Yeah, and it, smoking can affect both partners as well. So it can affect women in terms of quality of eggs and also risks of miscarriage. And also men has been shown to affect the sperm DNA integrity and things like that. So if you have a couple who both are smokers, they really, really um, would benefit from, from stopping. Not to mention in pregnancy, the further risks as well. So I've, I've listed here health conditions. We've spoken about age and we, we spoke about lifestyle. How about health conditions and how they may affect fertility? Well, this is how I think about it. 
any condition that will cause low egg numbers may affect your fertility, such as advanced age, or like we said, having um, cancer, or if you've had surgery to the ovaries before, anything that stops you ovulating will make it more difficult for you um, to become pregnant. And again, you'll see later on in the presentation that all of these are linked to different treatments. So polycystic ovarian syndrome often is the number one cause of um, anovulation. Things that cause the tubes to block, like infection or endometriosis, that would stop you from getting pregnant. Anything inside the uterus that stops implantation or interferes with implantation, like fibroids or scar tissue, um, that would cause infertility problems. And again, all of these have different treatments potentially. And of course, anything that causes sperm problems. It's interesting and important to say that very frequently, there is no explanation for infertility. And in 2022, we might have lots of tests and we might think that we're good at what we do, but still we have a lot to learn. So unexplained infertility is probably one of the commonest causes as well. However, we have to remember that infertility does not only affect women. Thankfully, there's been a big shift in the last few years of how the topic of fertility is approached. But, you know, years ago, it used to be all about women and men were never infertile. It was always the woman's fault. And uh, nowadays, we know that male infertility is as common as uh, female infertility. So uh, it has to be given the attention that it deserves. So looking at this slide here, up to 50% um, of cases, there may either be male infertility or a combination of factors, including male infertility. And what is interesting to note is as the years are going by, male infertility is increasing in incidence. Um, and I think a lot of contributory factors, whether it's diet, age for men also plays a role, but um, we, have to, we have to focus on, on um, the male side as well. This isn't just a woman's you know, topic. So I'm glad to see that slowly more male topics are being approached and men are becoming more open to discussion. So how do we identify which treatment is right for us? Well, we see the different conditions and we'll link them up with different treatments, but um, we have to do fertility assessments. The commonest fertility assessments we do is an ultrasound scan, a so-called HICOSI, which is a hysterocontrasonography, but that means injecting dye to look at the tubes and see if the fallopian tubes are open. We do blood tests and we do semen analysis. So I've written here what we can identify or pick up with each test. So with the ultrasound scan, we can look at uterine problems. We mentioned things like fibroids, for example, and scarring. We can look at the ovaries, so we can pick up low egg number because we can look at follicles. And if we don't have many follicles, we can know that there'll be a problem with egg number there. On the other end of the spectrum, if you see lots of follicles, um, that can imply polycystic ovarian syndrome. So you may worry that someone is not ovulating. You can also see other ovarian problems like cysts in the ovaries, um, which may need operating on, for example. So that's what the ultrasound scan can help us with. The hycosi is an addition to the ultrasound scan with the dye, and we'll look at whether there's a block in the tubes or not. When you look at blood tests, the blood test can again look at the number of eggs in a different way than the scan. So it can look at it through a test called AMH, which is very well known and popular nowadays. Equally, it can pick up on very high egg numbers like polycystic ovarian syndrome, but also other hormonal imbalances like diabetes or thyroid problems, which can contribute to infertility. And finally, semen analysis will look at sperm problems. So unfortunately, women have to do more tests than men, and uh, the male testing is the simplest one. Uh, but all four of these are, are equally important in the assessment. Now, when we look at the different treatments, the commonest treatments that we come across and people know are IUI, which is insemination, where we collect sperm and then inject it into the womb at the time of ovulation. It's almost the fancy way of doing what naturally we would do. Um, 
it does help with timing and it does help with sometimes filtering the sperm and getting the stronger sperm there, but it doesn't drastically change how conception happens versus trying naturally. IVF is a significant step up where we give medication and doing a procedure, we collect women's eggs, which we don't do with IUI. When we collect the eggs, then we fertilize them with a sperm in the lab. And then a few days later, we can transfer an embryo into the womb. Adding on to that, we can do these treatments with donor eggs and donor sperm, whether it's for single um, individuals or whether it's for uh, couples who may have no sperm or no eggs uh, or failed treatment in the past. So IUI, who, which patients does IUI suit? So IUI can be very good for lesbian couples because they will need donor sperm and it's usually very minimally invasive and actually uh, very successful. However, again, it's often forgotten, but we still have to test the female partner or patients for problems with tubes or ovulation, because if you try to do IUI and a woman has blocked tubes, um, or they're not ovulating, it clearly won't work. So it still has to be, the workup has to be thorough. In some cases, we can do IUI for unexplained infertility, where all the tests are normal. Um, and I think later on, I've quoted a study that says that above the age of 40, IVF is often recommended over IUI. IUI can be also used when um, couples have difficulty with erection or ejaculation, or they have painful or difficult intercourse. Less commonly, if a male partner has HIV, IUI can be used to wash the sperm to reduce the risk of transmission. And sometimes couples don't wish to undergo IVF. Um, they may not like the invasiveness of it, or it may be for religious reasons, or they want to try something less invasive. So in all these cases, IUI might be appropriate. And also, I presume for um, <clears throat> heterosexual couples where there's male factor fertility issues and everything seems to be OK with the female partner, if they're using donor sperm. So, yes, if it's with donation, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of IVF, so originally IVF was um, discovered and developed for tubal factor infertility. Um, so Louise Brown's parents, uh, the, her mum had blocked tubes, but clearly over time IVF has been used for a whole array of conditions um, and ovulation, for example, unexplained infertility, increased maternal age and other special circumstances where we need to do biopsying of the embryos, for example. Other cases in single parents or same-sex couples, for example, IVF can be used. And like you rightfully mentioned, you know, sometimes it's a very interesting debate whether someone goes down the route of IUI or IVF. ICSI is an additional technique which we add on to IVF. The first baby was born in 1992, and since then it's become a major part of fertility treatment. Um, ICSI was developed because they used to collect the eggs from the woman, collect the sperm, leave them in a dish overnight, and the next day there'd be no fertilization. So all of the process would be done in vain. And they clearly discovered that the sperm was weak. Um, and we shouldn't put blame on anyone, but it was the sperm's fault on those occasions. So they would screen and find the strongest and healthiest sperm and literally inject it into the egg. And lo and behold, the next day, fertilization would have taken place. So ICSI is the answer for male factor infertility. Um, it's also the answer when you've tried IVF previously and there's been no fertilization, even though the sperm looked healthy under the microscope. This is slightly more specialized. So this is um, biopsying of the embryos. These are terms um, people may come across, so I thought I'd add them here. PGTA is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. That's basically looking at the number of chromosomes and making sure that the chromosomes are all balanced. Can I this, just check, the name for that has recently changed, hasn't it? Would people, um, maybe people may have heard of PGS? Yeah, yeah, so it used to be called um, PGS, S for screening, 
and now it's been updated to uh, testing for unemployed. Um, and again, for PGTSR and PGTM, for example, they PGTM may be used synonymously with PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So most commonly now PGTA is used, and it's um, used to look at whether there's a balance in chromosome number. Um, you would expect that if you have the correct number of chromosomes in an embryo, the chances of success are higher. But that's something that's currently still debated. And our own regulator in the UK, the HFBA, has given it a red flag, meaning it shouldn't be used routinely and they don't support the routine use. Across the Atlantic and the United States, um, in some areas, they use PGTA routinely. So clearly in the years to come, we will know where PGTA fits in. PGTSR and PGTM, um, PGTSR is for structural rearrangements. So sometimes parents have the correct total genetic material, but it's sitting in their cells in an unbalanced way. So when they have a baby with someone, when it splits, it doesn't split like a mirror, it splits unevenly, and that can cause infertility. So with PGTSR, you're able to screen the embryos and find the ones that are balanced versus the ones that are unbalanced, if that makes sense. PGTM is looking for specific gene problems. So someone might have a specific genetic disease that, and they don't want to pass it on to their children. And they can test for a specific disease of the embryos. And if you have four embryos, they may say, well, oh, these three are unaffected, but this fourth one we definitely shouldn't transfer. Other treatments we shouldn't forget are ovulation induction, for example, for women with polycystic ovaries. It can be in the form of tablets um, or injections. By far the commonest one is Clomid. Um, and I think what I get asked mostly by people is, shall I just take a tablet of Clomid if I'm struggling to conceive? If someone doesn't ovulate, then taking Clomid is a good idea. If they do ovulate, then by taking Clomid, you're not adding anything, but all you're doing is you're adding the side effects. So it's like taking a painkiller when you don't have any pain. You might get tummy upset where actually there was no pain in the first place. Clomid has a side effect of making the lining thin. So for a woman that's ovulating, if she takes Clomid, it may reduce her chances in a way um, because of a thinner lining or may increase the risk of having multiple pregnancies like triplets, which are high risk. So I guess the take home message is Clomid isn't just the treatment for everyone. Surgery, we shouldn't forget as well. Surgery or reproductive surgery is a dying art. Um, and sometimes the tubes are so blocked that there's nothing you can do to unblock them or you have to remove them. But sometimes the blockage is so subtle that by doing simple surgery, you may open up the tubes and someone may get pregnant naturally. Um, the uterus as well, if you have fibroids, you can operate and remove them because even if you have fertility treatment like IVF, the fibroids will still be there. Similar for cysts, they might get in the way of egg collection. For polycystic ovaries, people might not know that there's a surgical treatment called drilling that can help with ovulation as well, which was discovered accidentally. So years ago, someone injured the ovaries during an operation and the women said, oh, I'm ovulating now. So they found out that by drilling the ovaries, it can help ovulation as well. So not done as frequently, but uh, worth mentioning. And finally, endometriosis can affect fertility. So surgery can be used for that. So how to know which fertility treatment is right for me? So, based on individual circumstances. So let's go through them. For fertility preservation, egg freezing and sperm freezing is the treatment that's, the, that's appropriate. For single women, donor sperm IUI, like you correctly mentioned earlier, Louise, or IVF is the right treatment. For same-sex female couples, again, donor sperm IUI or IVF can be the right treatment. IVF allows for reciprocal IVF treatment, which is amazing, really. It allows you to take eggs from one woman, fertilize them, and transfer the embryo in another woman. So both parts of the, of the couple are involved in the fertility process, which I think is amazing. Same-sex male couples, IVF with surrogacy is usually the treatment um, 
that's recommended. How about based on health conditions? So anything that may cause low egg numbers, IVF or particularly egg donation as the treatment that will give the highest chances of success. When women aren't ovulating, like we said, ovulation induction with tablets or injections or IVF will be the right treatment. Anything that causes a tubal block, you can either do IVF where you don't need the tubes at all, or you can do surgery in some cases if you think that actually the blockage is subtle and you can unclog it safely. Anything that stops implantation, like fibroids, that will need surgery. You can't overcome that with IUI or IVF. Sperm problems, like we mentioned, ICSI. And often there's no explanation, but thankfully there's a solution. So sometimes we frequently rather, we don't find a cause. Uh, and in that case, IVF will, um, will overcome the problem. Very important to mention that um, other than egg donation, IVF or ICSI treatment itself um, is significantly affected by age. So you can see in this graph here from the HFEA that the older someone is, the lower the chance of success, even with these sophisticated treatments. So if you're 35, the chance of it um, working per go is about 30, 35%. Once you reach 44 years of age, it's less than 5%. Miraculously, with donor eggs on the right hand side, the success rates pretty much remain the same, irrespective. Why, of the why do the success rates change so that they go up when you get older at 43? Oh, you mean with the donor eggs? Mm -hmm. So, this is likely not to be statistically significant um, because the differences are between 30 and 33 percent, say. So, Probably I would say that in all ages, they're likely to be very similar. They're likely to be very similar. So the question of which fertility treatment is right for me, it's not that simple and there isn't an umbrella answer we can give everyone and say IVF is the right treatment. There's so many different circumstances and so many different conditions that ideally it should be guided by a fertility team. Um, and I guess that's probably the most important thing, finding the right treatment. It sounds like a, it may sound like an easy question, but it's probably the hardest question for, for many um, individuals and couples. With regards to apricity, apricity was developed um, to help with individuals and couples in their fertility journey. On the one hand, trying to maximize chances of pregnancy, through technology and artificial intelligence and in the labs and with partnerships with some of the strongest clinics in the UK, but also looking at the patient support side, um, offering transparent services and having a fertility advisor 24-7 um, essentially to offer personalized support because there's clearly the technical and scientific side, but there's also the emotional side and both are equally important. Now, with apricity, um, apricity is able to do a lot of the work, like we mentioned before, remotely. So um, we are able to see patients from the comfort of their home. We're able to do a lot of the consultations from there. Uh, we're able to do blood tests from home if necessary, even ultrasound scan we're trying to develop at home. The costs, the team make a very big effort to uh, be transparent with or give a whole final cost uh, assessment for treatment. And there's partnerships with a number of top clinics throughout the UK. So from all over the UK and particularly around and within London, um, there are clinics that uh, Apristi partners with that are hopefully the most, uh, well, will hopefully help with the journey and make make it even more convenient and reduce stress in that sense. The personal fertility advisor is probably one of the things that sets the service um, apart because you have a dedicated app and a dedicated advisor who is, I think of it a bit as a, a wedding planner. You don't have to plan your whole wedding and you know, going through infertility and having to plan your, own, your fertility journey is not an easy thing. So having your fertility planner as it were um, that can make a difference. And 
again, so far, this has been translated in good rates of uh, pregnancy and success. So hopefully they will continue. Questions. We've had questions come in in advance. And if anyone has any questions whilst we're live, please feel free to ask. Um, thank you so much for those slides. They were so uh, digestible and it was really good to understand uh, when people might need certain treatments and who certain treatments might be best suited for, depending on your age, situation, etc., and circumstance. Um, are there any risks associated with different types of tr the treatments that you mentioned before? So um, generally fertility treatments are safe nowadays. Um, with IUI, the main risk or ovulation induction, helping someone ovulate, the main risk is actually being too successful, having too many babies, because we don't, twins may sound great and they are great, or triplets, but the risk in pregnancy is highly um, significant. Um, so ideally, we want to have one healthy baby rather than two or three. So that's probably the number one risk. With regards to IVF, <clears throat> a lot of people ask about risks to the baby and to the mums. I think I've added some a couple of slides after this. I can even refer to them if you have a look on the yeah. next slide. Let's see. There we go. So this is the risk of birth defects with assisted conception or fertility treatments. And this is a publication, we won't go into it in great detail, but it's literally in the last couple of years. Um, and it is from the United States. And if you go on to the next slide, I think we've included here, Eloise, again, it looks busy, but the bottom line is they looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of babies born naturally or through fertility treatment. It seems like with the natural conception, the risk of birth defect is about 1.9%. With IVF, it increases by, <clears throat> well, this is an interesting one. It increases by about 18%, which sounds super dramatic and very high. But because 1.9% is low to begin with, it, that brings it up to about 2.2%. With ICSI and particularly when a man has sperm weakness, um, the rates of defects come up to about two and a half percent. Now this study wasn't able to explain why that is. Is it because the treatments increase the risk or is it because of the underlying reason why people have infertility? And most people believe that it's the latter. For example, if a man has weak sperm and can't get pregnant naturally, <clears throat> When you do fertility treatments, it may be the actual weaker sperm that results in abnormalities or birth defects rather than the fertility treatment itself. Hmm. Did you have another slide you wanted me to move on to? Because we just had a live question that I'd love to ask you if that's possible, please. I think there's a very quick slide after this. Yeah, sure. Which looks at the risk for the women. Yeah, risk for mum. So this was done from a whole lot of friends of mine at Imperial actually that looked at cancers, and that's something I get asked a lot, so I thought I'd share with you. Risk of cancer with IVF, in fact, mm -hmm. with all types of fertility treatment. And the bottom line is that looking from a whole array of studies, um, there doesn't seem to be an increased risk of breast, ovarian, endometrial cancer, or the female cancers. And bizarrely, they found that it may even reduce the risk of cervical cancer, probably because people get pregnant, and that's protective. So, the single slide is probably will hopefully serve to reassure mm. uh, the audience. <laughs> there have been certain celebrities who have been quoted saying things in the press um, about IVF um, and it bringing on menopause. Um, have you ever heard people concerned about that before? Bringing an early menopause? Mm. Yeah, I have and I get asked that a lot. To the best of my knowledge, knowledge, I don't know that to be the case. I'm looking from studies as well. Mm -hmm. Even the way that um, fertility treatment works, every month a woman will lose a number of eggs anyway. So with a natural ovulation, one egg will be released. One, one will be ovulated. With fertility treatment, you just try to grow more eggs. But overall, it should be the same number of eggs that are lost. It's a little bit like a wave in the sea, I think of it. 
when you have waves in the sea, once the wave comes and goes, you know, it's gone, you can't get it back. So all the eggs of that particular wave will have gone. With fertility treatment, it's just a matter of trying to collect as many eggs as possible with IVF, for instance, in that wave, but it shouldn't, um, it shouldn't affect the menopause. The question we've had live is, um, this lady is nearly 32. She has low AMH of 6.22. Her partner's 37 with low morphology. They've had one round of IVF with good embryos, a good embryo transferred, but it didn't develop any, uh, sorry, but it didn't develop. Do you have any advice for this kind of situation in terms of how you, what kind of treatment you would look at next after this situation? So <clears throat> it's clearly difficult to give really strong and coherent advice without having the full information. Um, so both myself and yourself, we're always careful, I guess, to you know, be cautious in terms of advising without having full information. Um, a lot of, from a round of IVF, you get more information, I would say, than any assessment you can do. It's more important than an ultrasound scan or blood tests or anything like that. So from this round of IVF, the team will be able to give this patient um, some good feedback and advice moving forward. If they have had, if someone has had a low AMH, and they've had a good quality embryo transferred, but it didn't work. Um, very frequently, that is just a matter of chance. For example, on average, one in three embryos will implant. So it is almost like flipping a coin, you know, it may not work the first time. And sometimes the answer is just to try again. There is one very important take home message I have for this lady is that AMH looks at the number of eggs, but doesn't look at the quality of eggs. So someone, I've seen it happen quite a few times, women in their early 30s, I've seen have one egg and literally get pregnant just from one egg in an IVF cycle. So it's not, it's not, about, it's not primarily about the quantity, um, it's about the quality. So if the advice from the clinic was to try again, um, it may not be unreasonable and actually it may work in the second or third attempt. So I guess I would, um, I would stay positive and um, wish the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I know it's of course difficult to uh, give thoughts and advice without um, the medical background. Now, um, back to questions that came in in advance. And if anyone ha else has any live, please do feel free to ask before we wrap. Um, how can people learn more about egg and sperm health? You mentioned diagnosis and testing, yeah. and you mentioned people having egg and sperm health tested even before the stage of having a fertility issue. W what else would you suggest when it comes to finding out more about egg and sperm health? And is it something that people should look into if there have been, um, you know, problems in the family with fertility and things like that? Yeah, I think, Eloise, thankfully, we, we've covered a lot of that. Health in eggs and sperm will be related to age, other previous conditions. All of that can be assessed from uh, the history um, and the test that we have. There are some further advanced tests like um, sperm DNA fragmentation, for example, but some of these tests I would advise um, discussing on a case-to-case -case basis um, yeah. with, you know, a clinician. Um, also lifestyle that we mentioned, you know, that will affect the quality. And sometimes you don't need to, well, let me put it this way. Sometimes you can do a sperm DNA fragmentation and you can have a poor result. And that looks at the DNA integrity of sperm. And a doctor will say, well, you know, you, your result is quite poor. Have you been healthy? Are you exercising? Do you smoke? Do you do all these things? And the patient will say, oh, well, I do, you know? So the advice is stop smoking, reduce stress, do all of these things, take some, improve your diet. And then you retest it and it's an expensive test and it comes back better. And I often think, well, actually, we, we didn't need to do that test. You know, we kind of knew at the beginning that there are some things that we could have modified or improved. 
Um, so it's a combination overall, it's a combination from the history, the age, lifestyle, plus the tests that are, that are available. Mm -hmm. And that leads on actually to natural solutions for fertility. Are you, what are your thoughts in terms of um, supplements and diet and exercise, etc., to increase chances of conception? So that's a nice, um, that's a nice question and always debated. Um, I think I have two slides on diet. Can you, do you want to check and see if they're further? Oh, where are they? Are they at the back? I think they're further at the back. Oh, yeah. There we go. So I have diet and female fertility. Doctor, what weight? I thought that would cover that question. Um, this is literally from the American Society from a couple, well, a few years ago, 2018, where they genuinely looked at all the data that's out there. And it is from Harvard Medical School. So I guess, you know, we have to listen to them and from MIT. So they came to the conclusion, I've highlighted it, that women trying to achieve pregnancy are encouraged to increase consumption of whole grains, omega-3 fatty acids, fish, soya, and reduce the consumption of trans fats and red meat. In addition, a daily multivitamin that contains folic acid uh, before and during pregnancy may help with birth defects, but also increase the chances. It talks about vitamin D and says there's limited evidence about vitamin D, but there's promising evidence from non-human studies. So I think here in this um, American publication, they summarize it beautifully for, for women. And the next paper is specifically for men. And it, you'll see that it overlaps. So on the next one, it talks about use of antioxidant supplements and follow healthy dietary patterns, things like seafood, poultry, nuts, whole grains, fruits, vegetables. Again, like we're saying in Louise, it's something that if someone was to think, how can I improve my diet or what should I eat or not eat, they wouldn't have to even read the publication. So a lot of it is thankfully intuitive. Um, there is evidence for antioxidant supplements and um, again, omega-3 fatty acids and from fish and nuts. And I think the simple take home message from the evidence is that an improved or healthy diet helps and also supplements probably help as well because I often get asked and usually more from men than women you know do these supplements help or are they you know are they gimmick do they not help and I say that actually the evidence probably supports them so um in terms and if it's not going to harm anything why not try yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say be careful with which supplements. Sometimes there are supplements that are super duper expensive, but the consistency inside and what they, the ingredients are the same. So I would say by all means, have a look around and pick the supplement that suits you best. But I wouldn't say that the more expensive, the better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna see which other questions we haven't covered because we just had another one come in. Um, Miscarriage relationship to, and I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but anti-phospholipid yeah, syndrome yeah. and IVF success rates. I have a slide for that, Eloise. It's right at the bottom. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, let's see further, further, further. Is it after this one? Nope. I have it on my version, but not your version. Don't worry, I remember it off by heart. So, um, Antiphospholipid syndrome is probably the number one cause of what's called recurrent miscarriage. So repeated loss of pregnancy. Um, in the UK defined as three or more miscarriages. Antiphospholipid syndrome is it's mainly, it's often coined as sticky blood. So it's a, a prothrombotic condition. So that means that the blood clots easier. And it's thought to possibly one mechanism may be that it clots the placenta early on, so it can cause miscarriage that way. So it's very famous, you know, with regards to miscarriages. I guess the question here is, does it affect IVF or infertility? Now, in my version, I had added a slide, which was from the Canadian Society that was looking into implantation failures. Um, and when they looked at this antiphospholipid syndrome, actually they didn't find an association with IVF. So it seems that this syndrome can affect miscarriages, but doesn't necessarily affect the chances of getting pregnant with IVF. Having said that, 
a lot of couples may have a bit of a combination of both, you know, they may have had one or two miscarriages, and then they may be struggling to conceive as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing that I would speak to a, a clinician on a case by case basis. Um, I wouldn't do it as a blank blanket treatment. That's, yeah. that's what the Canadians were recommending as well in the latest guidelines. But like I say, for some couples, because not everyone fits in a particular box. And I guess that's where fertility treatment becomes a bit of an art in a way. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I think for some couples, antiphospholipid syndrome may be relevant. But for others, I think they could spare the extra kind of testing and anxiety around that. So I would... Uh, look at it on a case by case basis. Thank you for answering that one. Um, can AI, artificial intelligence, determine the right fertility treatment? What are your thoughts? Do you use it? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so the correct answer for this is that it probably will, um, or watch this space, I would say. <laughs> That's probably the correct answer. As we speak at the moment, there are a lot of studies going on. In fact, if you Google um, the number of AI papers in the last few years, it's literally shot up in number. Interesting. Um, and a lot of the work is within the lab because the lab, especially with the embryoscope, which is a digital microscope, essentially, that's taking pictures of the embryos as they develop, there is so much data um, that AI currently is, or studies using AI are currently trying to identify which embryos are the strongest ones and how you can improve your chances by using AI. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like at the moment, we're asking the embryologist to look at embryos and pick the strongest one to transfer. Um, you know, in, in the 60s, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon, if you watch the footage, they're doing all the calculations by hand. They didn't have calculators. And clearly now it's all done by calculators. Absolutely. So that's kind of where we're at now. The embryologists are literally manually looking at embryos and scoring them, but we're slowly moving towards artificial intelligence with regards to the lab. Mm -hmm. With regards to the clinicians, there's an introduction of artificial intelligence or we're trying to develop it for clinical decision-making. So which dosages and which medication is the best to give and how to increase or decrease dosages. Even we're looking at using artificial intelligence for scanning to measure follicles and things like that. So, I mean, I have a passion for it, but it's, um, it's emerging. And I think it will have a place in the years to come as you know, AI has with everything else. We don't use maps anymore. We use Google maps. True. You know? Uh, it's just that in medicine, you can't just, you know, bring an AI and start using it without having the necessary studies, which is the right thing to do. Great question. Great answer. Thank well, you so I, much. I wish I could see who it is because it's <laughs> um, another question that came in and then and then we'll, we'll um, leave it there. But um, I've also put out the details to the Pristy website. So please do contact the team or you can DM us to put you in touch um, to have a consult with Dr. Sotti, where, of course, him and the team can give you personalized advice um, and look at your history, etc. So, um the last question is a really good one too, and that's how long should you wait if you've been trying to conceive naturally? Like at what point if you're trying to conceive naturally, if you're in a relationship in a heterosexual couple to then decide, right, it's time to get this investigated or look into treatment options? It's a great question. I would first start off with, um, do, do the individuals have a pre-existing medical condition? Has someone told them when you're planning for a baby, you need to see a doctor or a fertility specialist? If that's the case, I would actually approach for preconception advice before trying, for example. Um, often that's not the case. Often that's not the case. In that scenario, when a couple is healthy and they haven't suffered from any trouble or medical difficulties in the past, um, the general advice is for a year under the age of 35 and after six months or so above the age of 35. Again, you know, this is not, this is not a strict 
um, number and people can be, some people want to try for a couple of years and even the nice guidance, you know, for the NHS, they often advise trying for two years, uh, particularly at the younger ages. Some people may wish to try a bit longer. Some people are a little bit more anxious um, and want a peace of mind. So they want to speak to someone first or do some early testing. But generally speaking, if there's no pre-existing medical conditions, a year under the age of 35 um, and about six months over the age of 35. A final thing I would say, Louise, I'm sure you will, um, you will feel the same way about this. Every now and then I come across couples who are very young, you know, they might be 26 and they've been in a relationship or they got married when they were young and they've been trying for five years, you know, and they, they seek help and everyone turns them away. They say, what, well, you're 26, what, you know, you don't need any assessments or treatment. And they try and they try and they try and they get turned away. And often I see couples like that and I say, you know, we're almost being ageist just because someone's young, we're not offering mm. support. And I've seen couples that literally have been trying for five years and they, they say, I, I don't know what people want from us. Do they want us to reach the age of 40 and then say, oh, you've left it too late when we've been trying from the age of 20? Um, so I guess my take home message is fertility isn't only, doesn't only affect individuals or couples who are older in age, Fertility can affect anyone and at any age. So if someone is young and they've been trying for one or two or more years, don't be shy. And, you know, if you visit your GP, tell them, no, I, I, I do deserve or I need assessment based on the amount of time I've been trying and um, stand your corner. Because imagine if you're 25 and you've got blocked tubes, you could try for 20 years and you'd never get pregnant or if you have no sperm. So we, we mustn't forget the younger ages as well. Um, it's very good advice. Because my, yeah, my husband and I were 30 and um, had a private MOT fertility test after six months. And that was because um, I was worried <laughs> and I had every reason to be worried because he has no sperm. And so we could have carried on trying for five years and would never have found out. Yeah, and very frequently, Eloise, I'll be honest, Younger, younger couples I see who have been trying and they've been trying hard for a long time, they are often the ones that have an identifiable cause. Um, and I always think, you know, thankfully they, they've been assessed and, and, you know, when they're at a younger age, they, they then have higher chances and they end, and, you know, someone may want a family at 25, someone may want a family at 45, we're not the ones to decide that. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering all these great questions. Thanks to everyone for sending them in. Here are the team's details. Please get in touch with Dr. Sotti and the team. They'd be so you know, pleased to help you. And it's been really wonderful talking to you about all of this today. So thank you for your time and your wonderful slides. Well, thank you even more. Lovely to see you. You too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.